This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. For as little as $10 a month, you can help people find life-changing guidance. Assalamu alayka zayn al-anbiya'i Assalamu alayka Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa afdal as-salati wa atamu taslim Ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadan Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana Innaka anta al-alim al-hakim Wa la hawla wa la quwata Illa billahi al-ali al In these gatherings of Iman, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exposed us to a discourse that we ask him to make it transformative, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to make it a means for us to implement these meanings and bring them into our lives, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, and then as a result be a means for other people to also experience this beauty. And when our teachers were fairly recently asked, about what people should be doing in the questioner asked about a particular continent. What people should be doing in this particular continent, which is primarily a place where Muslims are minorities. And our teacher responded very simply, very clearly. And the true inheritors of the Prophet ﷺ understand this meaning. He said, be people of good character and interact with everybody around you in the very best of ways and focus on raising your children. It's that simple. I.e., learn your deen, put it into practice. And those that are under your influence that you have an ability to affect, especially your children, raise them in the best of ways. Because think about if we raise our children well, then they're going to outlive us. They're going to be able to transfer those meanings through that upbringing to people that they're going to that be exposed to then. And think about the people that you know in your life that impacted you. Oftentimes it gets back to the way that their parents were, how it is what they were raised. How many people that are like that? How many people that are, are like that, that you find that there's some type of secret in that person from the way that they were raised? And this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this affair. Everyone has an opportunity to draw near to Allah, but there are certain people that have special blessings that come to them as a result of their father, their grandfather, their great-grandfather, or whatever it might be. And when Allah ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their father, which is the literal translation, was righteous. Referring to the two orphans, the, in the story of Khidr and Musa alayhi salam. And some of the commentators say that it was their grandfather on their mother's side seven generations back, their seventh grandfather. And as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused that special thing to happen. So we should never neglect this and to understand that this affair ultim is about living the realities of this deen. And this is the single most important thing of all that should preoccupy us. And as Ustad Amjad mentioned, we should be concerned about all people. And we should see people in this country as our people, as our brothers and sisters in humanity, that we are required before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reach out to them and to help them and to be means for their guidance, even if they don't want it, even if they don't respond to the call, even if they mistreat us, even if they say bad things about us, we are required to do what it is that we are supposed to do. And we should see these types of things happening as a result of our shortcomings, a result of that us being unable to really reach people in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should have this hem and this concern that should move us in our days and to move us throughout our nights. And various things that are happening in the time in which we live that are sources of fear for a lot of people. There is that widespread fear for a number of different things. And fear that we're going to become physically ill. Fear that uh, something's going to happen by way of j losing a job or something of that nature. Fear of a lack of state, fear of different sorts. And 
I want to approach this next great trait of chivalry from this particular perspective and how every time that you and I have fear due to the uncertainties around us in terms of our own health, in terms of our circumstances, in terms of the state of the country in which we live and so forth and so on, this is a that great opportunity for us to replace that fear with the fear of the one who we really should be fearing, which is Allah. And every time that you and I fear something worldly, we should be reminded of the fact that ultimately our fear should only be of Allah. Allah gave us fear as a means to protect us. If we didn't have fear and hope as human beings, we wouldn't be able to live. Both fear and hope motivate us, and both fear and hope prevent us from doing certain things. Normally you only think that fear prevents and hope motivates, but both fear and hope motivate and prevent. There's certain things you don't end up doing because you have hope, and there's certain things that you do end up doing because you actually fear. And fear and hope are very much a part of our lives as human beings. But what we are taught is to then understand these human instincts, if you will, human emotions is oftentimes how they're referred to in the modern world, these feelings that we have, and then to be able to have them to become virtues, munjiat, saving virtues that can help us in this world and in the next world. And so what the scholars of this science say is that when we look at our state, and we understand everything that we've done in the past. Every single one of us knows the thoughts that we've had and the things that we've done. We can hide it from even our spouse, maybe. We can hide it from certain things from even our closest friends. But every single one of us knows what we've done. We've all known the things that we all know what has happened in the past. And this is why the scholars of this science say is that you always have to keep this as part of your spiritual practice, i.e. fear. Fearing that, la ilaha illallah, we don't know what's going to happen in the next world. If Allah Ta'ala takes us to account, la ilaha illallah, man nuqish al-hisab idhb, whoever's asked details about their reckoning will be punished. And the hisab and yasira, the light reckoning, is mujarrad ard al-a'mahl, where actions are just shown, but we're not asked in detail. If we're asked in detail, which one of us is going to be able to respond before Allah? About what we all know that we've done. And I'm speaking about my own sinful soul first and foremost. No claims are being made here. We're in this together. But in the end, we will stand before Allah alone. Laysa bainu bainu tarjuman. There will be no interpreter between us and Allah. We will be asked directly. And the earth that we did certain things on will testify against us. Our limbs... Our tongues won't be able to speak and our limbs, our own limbs will testify against us. There's nothing, we have nowhere else to go. But from the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that everything else in creation that you fear, you run away from. But Allah, you flee to Him. You flee to Him. A'udhu bika minka. I seek refuge in you from you. I seek refuge in your contentment from your wrath. I seek refuge in that the well-being you grant your servants, right, from, the, from punishment. We seek refuge in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. La malja wa la manja illa ilayk. There is no refuge and there's no safety that from you except with you. There's nowhere to flee except to Allah. Fafirru ila Allah. And that's the beauty. And you and I have to have, fear has to be a part of our spiritual life. And when the scholars sometimes pre present it, they talk about ilm, amal, ikhlas, wara, and then fear. Because if you have to, you first and foremost have to have knowledge behind everything that you do. But knowledge isn't enough because you have to put that knowledge into practice. But that's not enough. You have to have knowledge, put that into practice, and you have to be sincere. You can't do your, put your knowledge and practice insincerely. So you have to have knowledge behind everything that you do and know what you're doing. You have to put that knowledge into practice and you have to be sincere. And then after that, we should move up towards what a scrupulousness, where we're careful about what it is that we do. It's not just anything that we do. And then even they say at the very end, still you have fear because you don't know the outcome. And 
The beautiful thing about this type of fear, when we fear worldly things, Allah subjugates us to our fear. But when you fear the one who deserves to be feared, he protects you from what it is that you fear. The only safety from hypocrisy is fearing hypocrisy. The only safety of that having a bad ending, that's Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is fear of having a Surah Khatim, having a bad ending. And so the more that we have fear of what we're supposed to have fear, the more that Allah protects us, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So this is a part of the spiritual life. And in this context of this word Sidq, they actually mention, in the min shart siddiqeen, mulazamat al khawf, the highest saints, the elect of the righteous, those who are truly close to Allah and near to Him. One of the conditions is that they always are in states of fear of Allah. And of course, they're balancing fear and hope. But it's there. You don't reach this degree of piety where it's like, oh, there's no more fear. And they have a fear because they don't know their ending. And they don't know if shaitan is going to lead them astray in the last moments. And because their fear is only of Allah, they don't fear shaitan intrinsically. Their fear is, is that Allah will subjugate them to shaitan. So the only protection from shaitan, because shaitan is like a dog. And if you try to fight a dog, and if it's a strong dog, yani, it might not go so well. But if you just simply call the owner, the owner can just whistle or just say something, and then the dog just obeys. And so shaitan doesn't have any power in of himself. Ultimately, his plot is weak. All he can do is whisper. But we don't know if we're going to fall victim to that whispering or not. So our fear is Allah subjugating us to shaitan, especially in the last moments. And there's a story that Ibn Jozi mentions in his book, Sifat al-Safwa. The title of his book is about the description of the elect. And this is a story of the great Imam, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And his son narrates this story, his son Abdullah, and how when his death approached, he was there with him. He was right by his side. And he describes in detail that he had that, a, that piece of cloth that getting ready for his death to do what you're supposed to do, shed lihyehi, as such, with a piece of cloth. And he said when he's witnessing this, he said he would see him profusely sweat and he would lose consciousness and then he would regain consciousness. And then he would see him say and move with his hand, la ba'd, not yet, no, not yet. And he's wondering why he did this one time and then two times and then the third time when his father regained consciousness, he said to him that, you know, what is happening? He says that we that think in a time like this that you start sweating and you're going to go. And then that he described to him what he heard him ha- saying. And so that Ibn, this is Imam Ahmed ibn Hamba, what did he say? Ya Bunay, oh son of mine. He says, you haven't understood. He says that Iblis la'anhullah, that Iblis, may Allah curse him, is that came to me, biting on my fingers, saying to me, Ya Ahmed, futtani. Ahmed, that I, I can't get you anymore, or that you've escaped me. And then I was responding to Iblis saying, La ba'd, hatta amut. Not yet, until I die. Shaitan is trying to get him in the last moments. Like, yeah, I got you. And Imam Ahmed understood, no, I can't say that until my soul is taken. So shaitan was trying to get him in that last moment and trick him. In saying to him, futtani, he's telling him, futtani. And he witnessed this. Is that you've escaped me. I can't get you anymore. And Imam Ahmad was saying, la ba'd. He wasn't denying the shahad. He wasn't doing it. No, he said, la ba'd, I haven't escaped you yet. And then Allah Ta'ala blessed him with a husn al-khatimah. And this teaches us is that what we want is tathbeet from Allah. Allah to make us firm in that moment. And fearing a su'ul khatimah is from iman. We should fear having a bad seal. 
And this, as we fear, we should also, as some of our teachers have said, that ask Allah Ta'ala for a husn al-khatima, a good seal, in every dua that we make. Because asking Allah for a good seal breaks the back of shaitan, they say. It breaks the back of shaitan. And so thinking about this is from iman. Now, this fear, of course, has to be balanced with hope. But I also want to present that a verse in Surah Al-Rahman, what does Allah Ta'ala say? When that we have fear here in this world, Allah Ta'ala will not join for a servant between two fears. The more we have true fear of Him here in this world, the more safety and protection we'll have in the next world. So we have a choice. And fear is an uncomfortable thing to talk about, especially in the modern world. But it's important because there's a lot of us fear a lot of different things. And that's harmful for us spiritually. And there's an opportunity, especially in times like now that are uncertain, that there is widespread fear. Let's, trans, let's change that fear into fear that's actually helpful for us. And then it will make us feel better here in this world. It will lessen the negative type of anxiety that one has about worldly matters. Because you'll constantly be reminded about your mortality and returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is very spiritually healthy for you. But Allah ta'ala says, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ The one who fears the maqam of his Lord. And that this can be translated as the standing before his Lord. He will have two gardens, two jannas. And Ibn Abi Dunya that mentions that on the authority of Ata in his synod that goes back to Ata, the Sabah bin Nuzul, the occasion of revelation of this particular verse. And incidentally, tonight has been about Sidq. And this story is about Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. And on one day, he started to think about the Qiyamah. And he started to think about everything that was going to happen on the Qiyamah. And the scales, Jannah and Nar, the angels lining up the folding up of the heavens and that the mountains being pulverized and all of the other that phenomena that are going to happen on Yom Qiyamah. And then when he was reflecting upon this reality, what did he say? He says that I wish, I wish that I was khudr. Khudr is like herbage. It's like greenery, like grass. That things that are eaten that by animals. He said that I wish that I was grass, literally, like herbage on the earth that is eaten by a behemoth, that is eaten by an animal. And I wish that I was never created. Because he was reflecting so deeply on these realities. It led him to say that. And as a result, Allah re revealed this verse. And as for the one who fears the standing before his Lord, he will have two gardens. Fearing the reckoning and that the that he Allah Ta'ala will honor this person by giving him two gardens. And they say that this could literally be two gardens in paradise, Bustanan, because the Jannah is a Bustan, that are that filled with red rubies and green gems of different sorts. Masirat Kuli Bustan Miatsana. The breadth of each one of these gardens is the distance that it would take for you to travel in 100 years. This is a, a reward that Allah Ta'ala will give you in the next world. Or as some of them have said, that like Imam al-Khushayri, he says, the first Jannah is here in this world. Is that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala will allow you to experience the halawa the ta'a, the sweetness of obedience to Allah Ta'ala. Wa ruh al qurb and that the beautiful nature of proximity to Allah here in this world. And so this is the amazing thing, is that if you fear the one you're supposed to fear, Allah, that protects you and He allows you to experience these beautiful things here in this world and then that He blesses you as well with paradise in the next. And as they refer to as Jannatul Ma'arif, 
that the paradisical states that Allah Ta'ala brings to the hearts from those who know Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So when we do this, Allah blesses us in this world and in the next world, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And one of the ways that we can that train ourselves to do this is that every time that we have any type of fear over a worldly thing, pause. And put in place of that fear of standing before Allah. Fear of what is going to be our state when we take our last breath. Fear of what it is that we're supposed to fear. Of. And then that Allah Ta'ala will move from states of fear to hope, fear and hope, fear and hope. And when our fear and hope is motivated by love, it will cause us to reach the highest degrees of fear and hope. Because when you love Allah and want to meet Allah and be close to Allah and to attain the contentment of Allah, your fear will be in being distant from Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your hope will be in attaining a gaze upon His noble countenance, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we always have to have a good opinion of Allah. Never forget that, especially as we transition into the new year of the Gregorian calendar. And that even though we're in 1442, in Jumarat Awwal of the Islamic calendar, of the Hijri calendar, we should always have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that inshallah, no matter what happens to us here in this world, even if it's a tribulation, may Allah ta'ala protect us and ward off tribulations from us. We should see that there's a divine wisdom in that and there's a hidden blessing in it. And there's something that oftentimes we can't attain except through that. And there's a maturity that will develop and an atonement for sins and blessings behind all of that if we see it as such and have a good opinion of Allah Ta'ala. And when Ustad Hassan was talking about these words, it just crossed my mind, this poem that we recite so often. Qad kafani al-murabbi. And in the fourth stanza, is that Imam Abdullah bin Adwi al-Haddad, as he says, Lam azal bil babi waqif, that I am still, I continue to stand at your door. And you knock on the door of Allah by constantly supplicating Him, relying upon Him in all of your different states, and turning to Him. Fa'adim rabi ukufi, and then he makes the farhaman rabi ukufi, that have mercy on my standing before you through my prayers and supplications and so forth. Wabi wadid fadli akif, that I am, that I continue to remain in the uh, valley of your bounty. Fa'adim rabi ukufi, is that make that this permanent for me. And then he says, Wali husnul lan ulazim. And that I adhere to having a good opinion of you at all times. It is my intimate friend and my ally. So three of the degrees of sadaqa, as an Imam Haddad is going to mention, between this line and the next line. وَأَنِيسِ وَجَلِيسِ طُولَ لَيْلِ وَنَهَارِ And it is my anis and my jalis, which is one of these degrees. So it's his khil and his halif and his anis and his jalis. And so meaning is that this applies to our brotherhood and that we want this between a one person and another. But also too is that taking companionship of husnudan billah, of having a good opinion of Allah in all of our states, such as it's our khil, it's our intimate friend, it's our halif. And this comes from a half which is to swear an oath. And your ally is the one who swore an oath to stand by your side. So it's your halif. It's that, that person that will be down for you and be there at all times for you. I.e. your good opinion of Allah. And it's your anis. The one who brings intimacy to your heart by being close to you in your jalis. Your sitting partner. The one that you spend time with and associate with. Tula layli wa nahari. That all day and all night. قَدْ كَفَانِيَ الْمُرَبِّي مِنْ سُوَالِي مِخْتِيَارِي May Allah Ta'ala bring these that realities into our lives. Ya Arhamar Rahmin, And to bless us to have that removed from our hearts completely 
the fear of anything other than Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, how we are in need of this. And may Allah wa ta'ala, as a result, bless us to move up into the degree of those who fear Him solely for, the, for, for, for because He deserves to be feared, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may we have our hopes in Him because He deserves to have us place our hopes in Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah bless us to have a good opinion of Him in all of our different states, despite what happens to us, and protect us and preserve us and ward off all tribulations from us and from the Ummah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org forward slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.